How we doing, everybody, and welcome to Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. I'm your host, Trage. It is Tuesday, a fantastic Tuesday, coming off the long weekend there. Got real busy over the Memorial Day weekend. I wasn't able to really get on. I mean, we had the episode on Saturday there. That was fantastic with uh, Aaron from Brutally Honest Sports and Kyle from Chopping of the Bit Podcast. If you guys haven't checked that one out, you got to check that one out. It was fantastic. Talked about a little bit of everything there between the Brewers and the NBA playoffs. We talked about a little bit of the Packers news with Jordan Love. It was a great all-around show. But today, I mean, I want to dip and dive. See what I, you know, I had some interesting articles. Coming out of this last weekend, and then, I mean, we had the Brewers. We had the Brewers. They had the weekend series there against the Red Sox. They also had, you know, the Memorial Day game against the Cubbies. Craig Council coming home to play at American Family, or, well, manage at American Family Field, and, well, it went about as we expected. So, with that, I mean, last talk about today, right away, I wanted to look at that Brewers matchup. The Brewers, and I want to talk about the weekend games first. We talked about the Friday game. I want to look at the Saturday matchup, and then I want to look at the Sunday game there against the Red Sox, and then dip and dive into the Cubs, right? We got to talk about the Cubs series and what is to come there against the Cubs coming up today here at 640. So with that right away, I want to get to the Saturday game against the Boston Red Sox. Brewers able to win game two of that series just like they did game one. They are able to win game two of that series. Behind a good outing from Colin Ray in that game. And also a big five-run third inning. Five runs in the third. That was the big difference in this one. And the Brewers, they just started torching the baseball. 11 hits on the game in total. Added one on late there in that eighth inning. That really separated them from the Red Sox there. It was a 5-2 to game going into the top of the eighth. Brewers stretch it to 6-2 to two before the Red Sox were able to add a run late in this one. But Brewers pulled it out 6-3 to three finish in that one. Looking at the wins, loss, and save, we had Colin Ray getting the win. We had Pavita getting the loss and uh, Trevor McGill knocking down a save there for the Brewers. Brewers in this one, we saw just about everybody get a hit outside of Blake Perkins. We saw Tarango 1-4 for four with an RBI. Contreras won for five, Yelich won for four on the ball game there, and then we saw Adamas. He goes one for four, Jake Bowers goes two for five, Sanchez one for three on the game there, Frelick two for four, Ortiz two for four, and we also and then like I said, Blake Perkins all for four, two RBIs for Ortiz, one for Frelick in this one, one for Sanchez, and one for Bowers in this game. So that was good stuff all the way around there by the Brewers. Brewers in this one. Only eight strikeouts, four walks in the game there on 11 hits. Not a bad day. Not a bad all day all the way around. Runners in scoring position, five for 14 with runners in scoring position. You like that, I mean, to get up just a little bit, right? But left eight guys on base, that's not a bad day. It's not a bad day at the office whatsoever. So Brewers able to knock in some runs there. Looking at runners left in scoring position, Blake Perkins left four, Adamas left two in that game there. So that was, you know, a couple of the guys leaving guys on. Other than that, I mean, Brewers, very good in this game. Got off and running. Yelich with a steal in this one. And then we saw Terang with a steal in this one. Jared Koenig started it for the Brewers, inning and a third. Three strikeouts for Koenig there. And then we saw Colin Ray, five and two-thirds, Three hits, two earned runs, three walks, two strikeouts. Hobie Milner for an inning and two-thirds. One hit, one earned run, one walk, and one strikeout. And Trevor McGill for a third of an inning there. One hit and one strikeout. Closed the door on the Red Sox. A lot of people, I guess, were questioning the Jared Caning in there to start these two matchups. One for Bryce Wilson and one for Colin Ray. And as far as I can understand it, not just to mention that the Red Sox started lefties at the top of their lineups, what also factored in was the analytical side of saying that Colin Ray pitches in his worst innings are usually in the first. So what they were trying to do was avoid that inning, the first inning for Colin Ray. And then for Bryce Wilson, I mean, probably a little bit more of the same. 
right? Trying to just ease him into a role. You know, Bryce Wilson, I mean, maybe that suits him better simply because he is used to that role. He hasn't been a starter before this season. He wasn't a starter last year for the Brewers. So maybe that's a role that he could fill a little bit more is doing that kind of, we have somebody else start the game and then Bryce Wilson comes in for five, four or five and gets us through it. That could be a role that Bryce Wilson rolls into. I don't know if that's how it's going to go moving forward, but as I mean, we saw Canning start a couple games here and Canning pitched very well for the Brewers in those couple of games there. He dropped that ERA down. So that was good stuff to see out of Caney. He's got that ERA down to 2.45 in 22 innings, and he's got 15 strikeouts in those 22 innings. So solid work out of Jared Caning and the role that he's been given. And that ERA continues to drop for him. Also, I mean, you cannot forget to mention Trevor McGill at the back end of that bullpen. He's got 14 games, 1.93 ERA, 18 strikeouts, and 14 innings. This guy is all over the place, and you'll get saves there for him. He's got, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, on the year. I was just trying to find his save total there. He's got uh, eight saves and nine opportunities on the year. Eight saves and nine opportunities on the year. Not a bad start for Trevor McGill at the back end of that bullpen for the Brewers. So good stuff there out of the Brewers in that second game of that series there against the Red Sox. Not much to, I mean, not much to complain about. Not much to see in that one. The Brewers pitching did a very good job holding down the Boston offense. We saw, you know, you look at some of the big hitters for the Red Sox in this one. Jared Duran, he was held 0 for 4. Wong's been hitting, he was 333 going into this game, 0 for 4. And then O'Neal. 0 for 3 in this one. Ref Snyder came in then 333. He was 0 for 1. And then Devers, 2 for 4 on the game. It's hard to get Devers out. It's hard to get Devers out there. Rafaela, he was 2 for 4. Outside of that, Brewers did a very good job holding down this Red Sox offense. Seven strikeouts and only four walks in this game. Pavita took the loss, like I said, for the Red Sox in this one. He gave up five earned runs. And then Kelly came in later and gave up that other earned run in three innings of work. So solid day at the ballpark for the Brewers on Saturday. That led into the Sunday game. The let's sweep this baby in Boston and end the road trip five and five, right? The end of that road trip. After this one, it would be four and five. I switched flip script on there. Four or five and four on the road trip. They ended up uh, four and five on the road trip. So a little bit of a difference there, I guess you could say, just one game. But Brewers lose the third game of the series there, two game, two to one in that one. That was a pitcher's duel. A runs are a premium, hard to come by, and the Brewers couldn't uh, muster anything across against the. Uh, against the Boston bullpen there late in this one. Boston would score a run in the bottom of the fourth. The Brewers would bounce back in the top of the fifth, and they'd add a run there. And then Boston was able to add a run in the bottom of the eighth inning there that led to the win there. Two-to-one finish in this one. Slayton got the win for the Red Sox. Paguero took the loss for the Brewers. And Jansen, Kenley Jansen, got the save for the Red Sox in this one. Good old Kenley Jansen. He's still he's still pitching and he's still pitching effectively. That's what we found out if you were a Brewer a Brewer fan in this one. Terang goes one for two on the game there, one walk. We saw Contreras go one for four with an RBI and a strikeout. Yelich one for four in this one. Adamas one for four. Bowers 0 for four. Sanchez two for four. Frelick 0 for four in this one. Dunn one for four and Perkins went one for four. I, I think the big one. In this game for me, the big one was Frelick. I, I got to say, it, it seemed like Frelick's outs came in very big spots. Very big spots with runners in scoring position in this one. And I thought that was a big killer. It, you know, the biggest thing that you know I struggle with with Frelick is sometimes it's a struggle for him to get the bat off the shoulder, it seems like almost. You know, he's standing in there and whoever's you know pitching we can use the Kenley Jansen for comparison there and he gets a cutter dead red and he watches it go by right and for strike three and it's like man oh man like what are you what are you watching what are you waiting for right what are you waiting for I I get being surprised but it seems like nine times out of ten he's being surprised by pitches that are hittable by good pitches right down I mean good pitches to to hit and that's where my worry comes with Sal. He came up 
through the minor league system and he came up into the bigs. And, you know, the biggest thing that I got out of watching him was his ability to see pitches and his ability to put the ball in play. And that's something that I guess, I, I don't know if it's slipping his mind right now. Maybe he's just, you know, sometimes you got to get into the groove, right? Sometimes you got to get into a groove. Maybe he's just, I don't, he's in a funk right now and he's just not seeing the ball very well, but it just seems like he goes up there and he hopes for a walk. He hopes for a walk. That's what, you know, in this game, that's kind of what I was seeing was a, I, I'm just, I'm hoping for a walk kind of moment out of him there. And it's, is it worrisome? A little bit, right? It's, it's a, it's a little worrisome, but you know, we, we take it in strides. You got to remember these guys are still, you know, kind of young yet, right? Sal's still a little bit young. I were talking about a guy who came up last year in June or July and then ended up playing the rest of the season at the big league level. But if you really think about it, he hasn't played a full year. He might now have accumulated a full year of big league time, but still young. This is just as basically the start of his second year in the big leagues, right? So he's going to slowly come along, right? I mean, it's the same with, you think about a guy like Jackson Cheryl. We could, right now we could sit here, we could close the book on Jackson Cheryl if we really wanted to, because he is struggling at times, right? He's struggling with seeing pitches and hitting pitches and driving the ball to the opposite field like he did so well in the minors and on his way up. We could, I mean, we could dissect this guy down to, he shouldn't be on the big league roster right now. But we just have to put the faith in that, hey, they're going to come around at some point. It's just a matter of how long does it take and when does it happen, right? So it's the same with Sal Frelick. It's the same with Frelick there. You know, as he's giving you that solid glove in the field. He's giving you the good at-bats, right? He's giving you some lanky at-bats. We just need to see the production side of it. And I think, you know, slowly but surely, we'll get the production side out of it. We're talking about a guy he's still hitting – uh, 247 on the year, two home runs, 11 RBIs. And you look at his last seven games there, he's hitting 182, 239 over the last 15. And then you look at these last 30 games, he's hitting 202. So you take that into perspective. The strikeouts over the last 30 games, 21. He's had three strikeouts over the last seven games and uh, eight strikeouts over the last 15. That's compared to the walk right now, where if you look at as of late here, he's walking more than he's striking out, but he's not producing there at the plate. Hitting into a lot of tough spots, too. I mean, you if we if we really wanted to, we could go back and look at every one of Sal Frelick's at-bats, but he is, he is hitting the baseball. It's just he's hitting it right at guys, right? And he's getting some unlucky swings uh, tied into that. You're going to see that with a lot of guys. I'm not saying you won't. But that is a, a factor in everything that we're seeing. So right now with Sal, I mean, it's a wait-and-see kind of moment. Right now I think he's – is he producing as well as what you would hope for? No, but I think he's coming around. I, I really do think he's coming around, and we will see Sal start to figure it out a little bit more there. Maybe get on a hot stretch here for the Brewers. Outside of that in this one, like I was saying there, you look at runners in scoring position, Brewers one for eight. They left eight guys on base in this one. They had run, they had opportunities. They had opportunities with runners on, runners in scoring position. They just weren't able to muster across any runs. That I mean, that plain and simple. They weren't able to drive in runs. They weren't able to come up with timely hits. They came up with hits. They just weren't able to come up with timely hits in this one. And you look at the strikeouts in this game here. 12 strikeouts in the game. 12 strikeouts in the game. You look at the middle of your lineup there with Adamas and Bowers and Sanchez. Those guys combined for seven strikeouts in total. Seven strikeouts from the middle of your order. The four, five, and six guys in your lineup. That ain't going to win you many games. That ain't going to win you many games. Unless if their one hit that came outside of that was a home run, it ain't going to win you many games, right? So that was the big struggle for the Brewers in this one was the strikeout rate. Tanner Hawk pitched a good game for for the Red Sox. I mean, there there isn't much else you could say. He pitched a good game, and then the bullpen came in, and they pitched good for the Red Sox. That's all I can say there is that the Red Sox, this was a good old-fashioned pitcher's duel. Runs were going to be a premium. It was just going to matter who could uh, muster across the run there. And, you know, what sucked the most was Tobias Myers. We've seen a little bit of his struggle here 
on this young season in his young, you know, uh, major league career and his debuts and everything like that with the big league club. Right now, I mean, look at this Red Sox game. Four and a third inning pitched. He gave up six hits on one earned run and four strikeouts on the game there. Not a bad day out of Tobias Myers. I thought he pitched very well. I thought he pitched very well for the Brewers in this one. They just weren't able to get him any run support on the game there. Piams, two-thirds of an inning then for a strikeout. He pitched great. I mean, I thought Piams did a fantastic job for the Brewers there, stranding guys on base there late. And then we saw uh, per, uh, Paredes in this one. And if you guys remember a couple weeks ago, I talked about Paredes down there at the AAA level. And I said, this is a guy the Brewers might want to call up here pretty soon. He had good numbers down there at the AAA level. And I said, man, oh, man, they might want to look at him to potentially come up to a big league roster. Here he is, an Ole Paredes. He comes up, gives him uh, had two innings pitch there and four strikeouts. Solid debut. You cannot ask for a better debut there in a the spot that he came into for the Brewers. This is a guy, he came over, he actually pitched with the Astros a little bit uh, between 2020 and 2022. He was with the Astros for a little while there. 2020, he pitched in 22 games with the Astros. 2021, he pitched in 12 games. and 2022, he pitched in three games for the Astros there. And then you look at him this season here. He was with the Brewers. And he was down there in Nashville with a 2-0 record, 1.13 ERA, 18 games pitched. He had five saves and six opportunities, 11 hits. And I was just trying to find the strikeout numbers, 34 strikeouts there. 34 strikeouts and 20 innings pitched. So you're talking about a guy who deals. I mean, he's got some good stuff, some nasty stuff, and good location with it, and some blow-by stuff. And that's what you love to see. And he, he, did, he, did, uh, he did debut it in his uh, first game with Milwaukee. So I thought that was fantastic there, out of Paredes. And then Paguero did come in, an inning pitcher, three hits, one earned run, and one walk on that inning he pitched. Paguero did struggle a little bit. Some might say, well, we should have left Paredes in. And, you know, in hindsight, yes, right? Two innings pitch, zeros across the board there, four strikeouts, yeah. But you're talking about a guy who is just making his major league debut. He already pitched in two innings. The third, you don't know what's going to happen, right? You don't know what could have happened in that third inning throw. And he's a bullpen guy. He He's not like he's a long relief, you know, where this is a potential starter. Like we're talking about a bullpen guy. So putting him into an extended role, especially in his debut, might have been a bad idea. So, I mean, you had the bullpen to work with. You had Paguero, and heck, you had Trevor McGill sitting out there too if you really wanted him to come into a game if you got into that kind of pickle. So, I mean, there was guys out in that bullpen who could pitch. So there was no reason why Paredes had to go three innings there. Now, like I said, in hindsight, yeah, probably would have been. If you think like that, then it probably would have been the key. But, you know, you, you can't. I, I, I see why Pat Murphy did it. And, or why he didn't do it, why he didn't bring him out for a third inning there. And I think it was the right move. I really do. I think it was the right move. Maybe along the stretch, maybe Paredes does develop into being able to go three innings, to be a three-inning guy for the Brewers. But until we get to that point, I'm not stretching this younger guy out. I'm not. I'm letting him you know, slowly get into the flow at the major league level. He's 28 years old, I and mean, he's a little bit older. He's a little bit older, but still, I mean, young in his major league career, if you really think about it. So good stuff there, though, out of Paredes in his debut. Brewers, they win the series, right? That's all you can ask for. They win the series. They go four and five on the road trip. That's not so good, right? The good news is the, the Cubs also sucked over the past week, right? The Cubs are also struggling. That made it a little bit better because then the Brewers still remained in first place. But if you look at the NL Central standings, a little bit scary. A little bit scary. So, But before we get to that, I want to get to the NL Central standings. I want to talk about the Cubs game. I want to just, you know, talk about a little interesting articles that I saw all over the place. But before we get there, I want to mention some sponsors of the show here quick. First game day supply in Alaska. Do you have a sports club or team? Are you looking for some sweet custom uniforms or apparel? Check out the awesome crew at Game Day Supply in Alaska to help your team get the sweetest gear. Find them on Facebook at Game Day Supply or online at GameDaySupply.net. Also, Spartan Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin. 
If you've been injured recently, whether at work, whether it was on the baseball field, the basketball court, whatever it was, you were mowing lawn, you injured yourself, and you need some physical therapy. Stop in there and see Chad at Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin. He will get you right. He'll get you back to work, back out mowing the lawn, whatever it is. Whatever it was you got injured doing, he'll get you back there and he'll get you better than ever. Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin. Marshfield Motor Speedway is located just three miles outside of Marshfield on County County Road H. You got to get down there this summer. Tons of family fun for all ages. All ages down there at the track. Great food, great drinks, great atmosphere. Nothing better than a great day, great night at the racetrack. Find the schedule online or on Facebook. Just search Marshfield Motor Speedways. You'll find the schedule there. Otherwise, go to my Facebook page, uh, Wisconsin Sports on the Go With Trades. You'll find the schedule shared on there. I also, if as much as I can, I share the details about the upcoming weekend and everything that's going on there. So make sure you stay tuned on the Facebook page to find out more there. Sports scene, sports cards, and memorabilia located in the Marshfield Mall in Marshfield, Wisconsin. You got to get down there. Tons of uh, sports memorabilia, jerseys, model stock cars, cards, protectors for them cards, plaques. I mean, they Al has everything down there. If he doesn't have it, he'll help you find it. So get down there. Sports scene in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Pittsville Farm and Home Center. At the store, they serve you anything from hydraulic hoses to red roses. You got to get down there right now. The greenhouse is open. Tons of good stuff happening down there. And you got to get down there for the great deals. Great deals happening right now. Find some of the deals on the Facebook page. Pittsville Farm and Home Center. They... They send them out on there. They have all the deals listed in the paper and everything like that. You got to get yourself down to Pittsville Farm and Home Center there in Pittsville, Wisconsin. And also your hometown team, Century 21 Gold Key Realty. Call Peggy Sewer Anna to find your dream home or if you're looking to sell. Find them on Facebook at your hometown team, Century 21 Gold Key Realty, or stop in and see them at their location in Marshfield. But with that, Brewers, Cubs. The I-94 rivalry was renewed on Memorial Day. Can you name a better day? Can you name a more? I mean, that that's everything you can ask for. Holiday weekend, you have the Cubs coming to town. You get the big crowd down there in Milwaukee, and you know why they're all there. Nobody, Nobody's there to watch the game. Everybody's there to boo Craig Council when he walks out of the dugout, and that was fantastic. That was fantastic. And I, I, I loved it. I loved it. They they showed it many times. I saw it on Twitter there or X, whatever you want to call it. Saw it across Facebook. Every time he came out of the dugout, they booed him. I loved it. I loved it. I thought it added a uh, more intense atmosphere. And I thought, you know, listening to Willie Adamas, it actually helped the players out too in that atmosphere. So I loved every second of it. I thought it was fantastic stuff that we saw out of the Brewer fans down there on Monday and what made it even better. This thing was a pitcher's duel. Robert Gasser against Justin Steele. And we're talking about two guys going back and forth, swinging haymakers all game long. Steele goes seven innings, three hits, eight strikeouts, one walk. Steele was fantastic. For the Cubs there, and then you look at the Robert Gasser, the young fella. The young fella coming into his own here in Milwaukee. Six innings pitch, three hits, seven strikeouts for Gasser. You want to talk about a guy who stepped up, and, you know, it's not playoffs. It's not, you know, anything like that. But this felt like it was a big game atmosphere, right? To me, to me, that's what it felt like. It felt like it was a big game atmosphere heading into this one and talk about a young dude walking in there and dueling it out with one of and when he's on one of the better pitchers not just on the Cubs but in the NL right Justin Steele we've seen him pitch in the past where this guy is fantastic and Robert Gasser went toe-to-toe with him out there I thought that was fantastic you talk about Robert Gasser through his first four MLB starts 1.96 1.96 ERA, 0.96 whip. And, I mean, you're talking about, like I said, this latest game here with seven strikeouts there on three hits going up against a Cubs lineup that has been struggling 
but a guy in Justin Steele who's dealing. And he goes back out there, back out there, and says, okay, you can do this. I can do this, too. I can do this all day long. Six innings for him of fantastic baseball. Got himself into some trouble. Two of those hits came in that seventh inning. Got himself into that trouble. But then we saw, I mean, they're talking about, you know, the top relievers in baseball right now. I need somebody to put respect on Brian Hudson. I need some analyst out there who isn't, you know, so like they're walking around hand in hand to the candy store with the Dodgers and the Padres and the Yankees and everything else. You know, I want somebody who walks in and says, Brian Hudson for the Brewers right now is 3-0 with a .59 ERA, 30 innings pitched, and 36 strikeouts. I want somebody to walk in and just say that. Because you look at this guy here. I mean, I'm just looking at stats. That's all I can do right. Seven holds on the season, right? He's came in seven holds, right? Hasn't blown one. Seven holds on the year. 30 and a third inning pitched. 15 hits given up. Two earned runs. Seven walks. 36 strikeouts. Hitters are hitting 140. Seven against Brian Hudson. 147. I don't know about you, but that's pretty darn good. He comes into this game, two guys on, nobody out, comes in, doesn't even blink an eye, and gets the Brewers out of the inning. And then goes out there for one more and says, all right, I'm going to put my foot down for one more inning here. One hit, three strikeouts, two innings of work. This guy is averaging crazy numbers. Crazy numbers. You're talking about a guy who in last season was with the Dodgers, right? He started with the Dodgers last year. 2023 was with the Dodgers. 7.27 ERA in six games. He had eight and a two-thirds innings pitched. 12 hits, seven earned runs, one home run given up, and seven strikeouts. Flip a script numbers. From the moment he put a Brewers uniform on, he has changed drastically. This guy is fantastic. This guy is fantastic. That's all I, that's all I got to say. And I, I really do hope that Devin Williams can come back and anchor down that closers role in the bullpen. Because if you give me a three-man punch of Brian Hudson, Trevor McGill, and... Devin Williams, not to mention if Pions gets straightened out, Homie Milner keeps pitching well, and then you look at guys like Paguero, and also if Abner Uribe comes back and pitches well, that's a solid, a solid bullpen right there. So, man, oh, man, I love what I'm seeing out of Brian Hudson. And then we saw Milner for an inning there. He gave up a run, gave up that one earned run on the game there, one inning, one hit, one earned run on one strikeout, one walk there for Milner. That ERA is at 2.45. Nothing bad there. Nothing bad out of Milner. Gave it up late there against the Cubbies. And, well, you know, they had Trevor McGill warming up at the back end of that, too. If it got a, if it got a little shaky, they had Trevor McGill warming up there. But, I mean, I want to talk about the Brewers' offense. One for four for Contreras. 0 for four for Yelich in this one. Adamas, two for four. Two for four, and Adamas doesn't even come to the plate if Madrigal makes the play at third. That's probably a double play ball, and that inning is completely different. But Adamas comes to the plate after, you know, a couple after that air, right? Because Yelich came up next there, and then we saw Adamas with first and third. And Adamas delivers 3-0. 3-0 green light, and Adamas says, "Hmm, I'll take this one. I'll send it out there. That was a beautiful swing from Adamas. That's something that I think Adamas lacks at times is he likes to drop the hands. He likes to get under the baseball a little too much. That was a perfect level cut that he just drove out of there to left center. That's what you love to see. The two things that I want to see out of Adamas are keeping the bat plane flat and driving the baseball and also being willing to go to the opposite field being willing to just wait back and shoot it the other way. Those are the two things 
that if Adamas does and he keeps doing, he will be a solid hitter in this lineup. And if he can do those two things consistently and become that solid hitter, I'm not as opposed to the Brewers saying that we want to sign this guy back long term. I wouldn't be as opposed. Now, do I think that the Brewers need to sign him long term? Probably not. No, because they have Joey Ortiz, they have Terang already in house, and then you have a couple of third base prospects coming through the ranks right now. So do I believe that they need to keep a guy like Willie Adamas around? Probably not, right? Probably not. And I'm not going to say that if you say that they don't need him, you're wrong because you're right. They really don't need him down the line, right? But right now, those other guys aren't ready. And I'm glad that they have him in the clubhouse. I'm glad that they have him out there at shortstop to really solidify. Because, I I mean, you talk about one of the better shortstop defenders, and then you have one of the better second base defensemen in baseball. And then you look at third base with Joey Ortiz. He's played very well at third. Was shaky early on in the year. He's very good at third base now. So you're talking about a infield now for the Brewers that is very good. That they, I mean, outside first base is hit or miss for me at times, right? Hoskins can be hit or miss for me at times. And then Bowers, he's played pretty well over there at first base. But, I mean, those other three guys, you're talking about a very skilled, very strong-armed infield there in Milwaukee. So, good stuff there. Good stuff for the Brewers there. But, I mean, you're talking down the lineup then. Uh, Sanchez and Ortiz both went over on the game. Churio had two hits. Good day for Jackson Churio. Something that we saw in that one was that double that he brought in a run late in this one. The th- my favorite part about that, he could have pulled it and it still would have been good, but what made it even better was he took an outside pitch and he shot it to right center. That's what made it even better was that he wasn't afraid to take the baseball the other way because when Jackson Churro is right and he's going right, it's the same thing. I, I I don't want to compare him to Ryan Braun here, but, you know, when Braun was right, heck, when even Christian Yelich is right, they're shooting the baseball the other way. You know, Braun was always notorious for shooting the baseball the other way. It, it, you look down the Brewers lineup right now, they have a lot of guys who are in that same boat, like Sal Frelick. Sal Frelick's a big known guy for just taking a high pitch on the outer half and just shooting it straight out of missile down that third baseline and keeping it fair. And Christian Yelich, same thing. When he's right, he's, I mean, you can pull the baseball a little bit. I'm not saying that these guys, when they were right, because when Braun was right and he was in his MVP year and he was in his, you know, early stages, the ball was everywhere, right? Same with Christian Yelich. But when those guys were feeling it, it was all facets of the field, but they were able to shoot the ball the other way at a high clip. And that's what I want to see out of Jackson Churl is him not to tr- – he rolls over on the baseball a lot. And it's not like, you know, I'm, I'm not – I'm not saying that, you know, I'm the only one who knows this, right? Everybody knows this. They're all seeing that he's rolling over on that baseball. And that's just something that as a young player – he gets ahead of himself probably at times, and he gets a little too amped up, right? A little too amped up. And he's just got to settle in there. He's got to calm himself down. Take a deep breath, right? And just shoot the baseball the other way. You know, let the pitch come to him and just go with it. Go with it the other way. Like you saw in Willie Adamas' home run. I didn't, you know, personally, when I saw Willie hit that, I didn't know it was getting out right away. I I thought he hit it well. Don't get me wrong, but... It wasn't like it was, you know, one of his big hacks, right? Because we've seen Willie take some monster hacks. It wasn't like it was a big hack. It was just a make contact with baseball, let the pitcher do some of the work, right? Let the pitcher do some of the work. That's the same that you want to see out of all these hitters. When you get into those kind of counts where you can let the pitcher do the work, let the pitcher do some of the work, just put the baseball in play, right? And that's something that the Brewers, I think they've gotten away from a little bit. And I'd love to see them get it back here. I'd love to see them get it back here because, man, oh, man, this lineup has got a lot of guys who love to get out there and run. And like I was saying there before, the great thing that I took out of this one was Sal Frelick getting a a hit in his uh, first. It was actually his first hit as a pinch hitter in the bigs. So I thought that was great to see out of Sal there. He was one for one, came in for Perkins late in this one, came up with that hit. Solid stuff. 
Solid stuff out of Sal Frelick there in this one. Like I said, Brewers get the win 5-1 to one in this one. Hudson gets the win. Later takes the loss for the Cubs in this one. And Craig Council gets booed out of the stadium when he leaves. Nothing better. Nothing better than that. And I can't wait for tonight's game here because I believe it's going to be a lot of the same again here for this matchup. Freddie Peralta taking on... Ben Brown for the Cubs in this one. Brewers have not faced Ben Brown for the Cubbies in this one. A little bit of success against uh, Freddie Peralta. We see Cody Bellinger in six at-bats. He's batting 500, three RBIs and a home run against him there. Ian Happ's got the most at-bats against him, but the most problems. Uh, 0 9 one average against him there. 22 at-bats. He's got two RBIs and a home run there. Nico Horner's got a 250 average in 16 at bats. He's got four RBIs. And then we look at Christian Morale has got seven at bats and against him there and a 286 average. Outside of that, not much success happening against Freddie. So it should be a good matchup here. Freddie coming in three and three with a 3.81 ERA. Ben Brown coming into this one, one and one with 3.20 ERA in this one. Last time out for Ben Brown was a solid one. He had a solid game against the Braves, four innings, one hit, two walks, six strikeouts in that appearance. Before that, though, I mean, this is a guy who's kind of just been thrown into a starter role. Before that, he had two innings against the Pirates and two innings against the Braves before that one there. All outings, I mean, only one earned run between his last three outings there. Limited hits, but limited innings. So this looks like it's going to be kind of a bullpen day for the Cubs there. If it stays like that, going to be interesting. It'll be interesting to see what the Cubbies do rotation-wise after Ben Brown is done in that one. And then that'll lead up to the Wednesday or the Wednesday matchup and the Thursday matchup yet against the Cubs there. So good stuff there. Brewers take game one against the Cubbies. Now, last but not least, I got a couple things I wanted to talk about here to end the episode. First, I wanted to do the, I saw it out there on Facebook and somebody posted it. They said, pick three to come out of retirement. It was Brewer players, pick three of them to come out of retirement right now. Say you had the power to bring them out of retirement. So the options across the line were Jonathan Lucroy, Cecil Cooper, Prince Fielder, Jim Gantner, Don Money. We had Gorman Thomas, Ryan Braun. We had Teddy Hagura. We had Robin Yount. We had Raleigh Fingers, Ben Sheets, Jeff Jenkins, Paul Molitor, Jeff Cirillo, and Jim Slatton right now. Those were the options of guys to bring out of retirement. Who would you bring out of retirement? And I'm guessing, I'm guessing would be in their prime, not just be out of retirement right now. Who would you bring out? That's a toughie. That's a toughie because I love me. I Okay, so where I'm kind of stuck, you know, I, I love me some Prince Fielder. I got to be honest with you. I love me some Prince Fielder. So my toss up right now is I if you could put Reese Hoskins if you could put Reese Hoskins just at DH, right? And then I could throw one of the other two, Cecil Cooper or Prince Fielder into that first base role. Who would I choose? That's a toughie. I think I'm going to I I want to say Cooper. I really want to say Cooper. I mean, we're talking about like 1980 to 1982 Cecil Cooper, 352 in 1980. And then we're talking about a guy who hit 320 in, uh, he hit 320 in 1981 and 313 in 1982. If we're talking about that Cecil Cooper, I almost feel like it'd be tough not to say Cecil Cooper for for this opinion here. I just love me some Prince Fielder, man. I just love the Prince Fielder aspect of it. I think I'm going to have to go Cooper. I, I, I think I'll go Cooper 
in that one. Fielder is, I mean, the man, the myth, the legend, Prince Fielder himself. It's tough to pick against him there. I think I'm going to go with Cooper. And then I'll be honest with you, I got to bring back Raleigh. You know, the bullpen for the Brewers, I think there'd be nothing better than bringing back Raleigh Fingers and throwing him out there in that bullpen. I think that'd be fantastic. I don't see how you don't bring him back. I mean, we're talking about a guy who later on in his career save lies. I mean, averaging, you know, 1977, he had 35 saves and 35 opportunities. And then you talk 1978, he had 37 saves and 37 attempts, 13 for 13, 23 for 23, 28 for 28. Like this was a guy that when you brought him in, he wasn't blowing the opportunity to save a game. This would be, I, I'm bringing back Raleigh. I got to bring back Raleigh Fingers in his prime to pitch for the Brewers here now. Throw him out there in the bullpen and see what he does. I almost want to bring back primetime Ben Sheets. That would be my third one. I I almost want to bring back primetime Ben Sheets because I just feel like you throw him into that Brewers rotation right now as the ace of the staff. I just feel like ugh, that's a toughie. Like primetime, like if we're talking 2004 Ben Sheets, like that's a solid, that's a solid guy. I mean, it's tough to say. It, it's really tough not to bring back a guy like Robin Young or Paul Molitor too, right? I mean, man, oh man, you want to bring him back. I'm just thinking about holes that the Brewers could potentially fill with some of these guys here. And those are just, <sighs> this is a tough one. This is a tough, I, I actually went into this and I thought I was going to have more of a straightforward answer for you guys. And now I'm sitting here and I'm like, I'm second guessing myself. Like, maybe, maybe I could bring back Robin Yount and throw him in there. Maybe I could bring back Paul Ma. I got my dog all fired up in here. He's His name's Yount, so he's all kinds of fired up right now. I keep saying his name around here. But I mean... Ah, oh, that's tough. That's tough. You almost you almost have to bring back a starter, right? You almost have to bring back a starter for the Brewers right now. Would it maybe be a guy like Teddy Hagora? Struggled late in his career, but early on in his career was fantastic. I it's that's my toss up. That's my toss up right there is between the starters on that list. I feel like you fill in that First base spot, you give uh, Hoskins a DH role all the time. Like, that'd be great stuff there. And then you bring in a guy uh, like Raleigh Fingers to anchor down the back end of the bullpen. Can you imagine a one-two punch of Raleigh Fingers and Devin Williams? Like, Devin's setting the game up for Raleigh back there at the back end of the bullpen. That's some good stuff. That'd be some nasty stuff right there. Hmm. This is a toughie. This is a tough one. Maybe we just bring back Jim Slatton. I don't know. That's my toss-up. Let's throw in Teddy. Let's throw early Teddy Hagura. We got Cecil Cooper, and we're bringing back Raleigh Fingers. I filled in all my spots there. I Man, oh, man, I really want to bring back Robin Yell, though, to play shortstop. But I feel like they can survive without him there. I just feel like, you know, you bring in a guy like Cecil Cooper to play first base. You put Hoskins at DH. Now you have good defense. You have good DH. Like, you can't really go wrong in that situation. I don't think you can go wrong with bringing any of these guys back. The only guy that might be a question is Lucroy, and you could just flip Lucroy to first base then, right? He'd play a little bit of first base. Just flip Lucroy out there to first base and call her a day, right? And it'd be great to see Lucroy back. But I think I'm going Cecil Cooper, and that's tough because I'm like the biggest Ryan Braun fan you'll meet, and I had to go against my guy Braun. I had to go against my guy Braun there. I mean, they should have said pick four, and then maybe I could have slipped one of my other guys in there, right? Maybe I could have slipped them in. But I thought that was interesting. I thought that was interesting. I want to hear your three. I want to hear your three. You'll see at the end of the podcast, at the end of the description, there's an option for fan mail. There's an option to send fan mail. I'd love to hear from you guys. Opinions, everything like that. Send me some fan mail on there. Leave a comment, whatever it is, on Facebook post, anything like that. Let me know what you guys think and everything like that. Like, subscribe, whatever you want. 
we I, I'd love to hear from you guys and be able to kind of see where you guys are leading right now with everything brewer wise too. But with that, that's about all I got for today. You know, I had a little bit else to get into, but we ran a little bit long. That's about all I got for today. We'll get more into it tomorrow there on the show. But with that, this has been Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. But until I talk to you guys again tomorrow, deuces. Watch me sway, darkness falls, and we all pray, hoping for the light of day. Down to the river, I have held the devil's hand, felt the weight of my own sin, burdened by the heart of man. Down to the river, down to the river.